Matthew Corbett is one of my favorite fictional characters, and Robert McCammon is one of my favorite authors. Hello everybody, how you doing? Welcome to the channel. Today I want to talk to you, you, about a book written by Robert R. McCammon, starring, if you will... Matthew Corbett, a character that McCammon has been working on for a while now in a series of books, and I think there's two more left in the series before he closes it out fully. <clears throat> but I want to talk about the second book in that series, The Queen of Bedlam. And um, so, in order to do that, I want to show you some of the copies that I have and then talk a little bit about the book, tell you what I think, if you care. So here's the copy that I read. This is a trade soft cover, first edition, first print. And I'm actually intending in December to go see Robert McCammon and at a Alabama Booksmith uh, autograph session that he's doing in Birmingham, Alabama. And this is one of the books I hope to get him to sign. Anyway, that's one edition. This one here is the first print hardcover edition the trade hardcover the first hardcover edition it came before the limited which i'll show you here in a minute this one was already signed when i bought it it was signed by robert mccammon so no sense in me taking that one to him to get him to sign it and let's see the let's see how do i know it's a first print first edition book i'm looking there it is there is our number line it goes all the way down to one and then yeah, the artwork, what do you think about that? I got it in a Mylar dust jacket, so it's very, dust jacket protector, so it's very shiny. Anyway, the artwork, uh, I'll let you reserve judgment on that. And then the, the sweet one, the sweet piece, the one I'm proudest of with this book is the signed and numbered edition from Subterranean Press. It is in a slip case, which is, see the dust? dust should hide the dust nobody should know you have dust and there's the dust jacket artwork can't see it with all the reflection how do you like that that is a neat dust jacket and it is limited to 374 copies of which mine is lucky number 13 so anyway i'm not here to do a a in-depth review of any of these editions i just thought i'd show you some of the editions that I have of this book. Now, talking about this book, Speaks the Nightbird is the first Matthew Corbett book uh, written by Robert R. McCammon. Speaks the Nightbird, I read it on a plane flight going to Alaska, and then I finished it on a plane flight coming back from Alaska. 800 and something pages, I think it was, and well, well, well worth it. It's... It's a book that felt like it had, it was setting us up for a sequel. I don't know if the intention always was to have a series, but that book left us with Matthew Corbett developing. He was a clerk for a magistrate and he was traveling to a town in the Carolinas to the magistrate was going to decide if this lady who was being accused of being a witch was guilty or not. Matthew Corbett was his clerk and Matthew Corbett was very sure that she was not a witch, and he set off to try to prove that. Um, it talked a lot about his past here and there, and that book, I'm not going to spoil it, but that book, le spoiler alert, there's a bunch of Matthew Corbett books, so he doesn't die in the first one. Anyway, that book left us off with Matthew having to go address issues from his childhood, growing up in an orphanage. Had to go address issues from there. And he was off to New York City to take care of that. His, uh, the magistrate he was working for made arrangements for him to go to work for somebody in New York. Queen of Bedlam picks up with Matthew Corbett in New York City, working as a clerk for a different magistrate. And this is where this, this, this book really takes Matthew and turns him into what he will become. 
the clerk that he's the magistrate that he's working for kind of talks Matthew out of his goals of trying to become a lawyer, saying it's probably not going to happen, and your passion probably your passions would probably be more suited doing something else. And he gives him the name of a lady who runs a business in London and other cities in, the, in Europe, and she's wanting to open a business in New York. And essentially, they are detectives. They solve problems. They take on challenges, and they're paid to do it. Uh, I, in fact, Matthew comes up with the term detective in this book. Matthew is loves that idea. He never never considered it because he's the kind of guy that solves problems. He looks at pro he asks questions that nobody else asks, and he's never happy until he gets those answers. And he'll do what it takes to get those answers. He's not uh, he's not a big, powerful, tough guy. In fact, he's quite the opposite. He's a very intellectual fellow and spends most all of his time on intellectual pursuits, reading, playing chess, writing, things like that. Anyway, he, he decides to uh, accept this job working for this company as a, what he would call a detective later on. Um, but part of that is he has to be trained. So this, the lady that owns this business has this big, rugged, tough guy who's got to kind of beat Matthew into shape to be a physical guy, fighting, sword fighting, stuff like that, and Matthew at first hates it. He hates the way this guy is treating him. He's being treated uh, kind of like a football coach would treat young kids, trying to toughen them up, get them into shape, mentally tough, physically tough. Matthew hates it. He resents it all, and he's driven by it also. He doesn't want this guy to see him fail. Anyway, this story has quite a few plots that are tied together. First of all, there's a murderer uh, in New York City. He's being referred to as the masker. And Matthew has to solve this. He's, he's taken, he's taken uh, an offer from a widow to solve who's the masker, get him solved, get him figured out, and get a nice prize in the process. At the same time, he's taken on a case where he's got to figure out the identity of a lady that's in a, a facility where people who are mentally challenged are being treated of all sorts, all sorts of mental challenges, psychological challenges. There's this lady uh, at this asylum, I guess is what they called it, who is pretty much catatonic. And she's being treated specially, unlike everybody else, and it's all being paid for. The, the doctors at the facility want to know who she is because they feel like if they know who she is, they can maybe help her. So Matthew accepts that job on behalf of the agency. And, uh, and that's another thing he has to try to solve. Also, there is a separate murder that they try to investigate and try to solve that's separate from the massacre. And another character is brought in. Is talked about a mysterious character, Professor Fell, and this is a this is a character that uh, like like speaks the Nightbird set us up for Queen of Bedlam. Queen of Bedlam is setting us up for a variety of future novels. Reading the Queen of Bedlam, it's obvious at this point that Robert McCammon has decided I'm going to do a bunch of these books, sowing seeds out there all over the place in this book for books to come. He mentions Mr. Slaughter, mentions Professor Phil. There's all sorts of things going on here. Um, future relationships, there's all sorts of things that are being sown, seeds sown for future books. And I, uh, I, I really like it. You get a lot of insight into Matthew Corbett and the way he thinks. And there's also a device that McCammon uses that I like because it's, it's not all a surprise. Many of these detective type novels, the detective is going along and he's asking questions and getting into trouble and all these things. And then all of a sudden, bam, you find out that he knows it all along and he solved the whole problem or they stumble into a solution and voila, it's all there. 
Robert McCammon will have Matthew figure out pieces of the puzzle. Sometimes he'll give you the information. Sometimes he'll tell you or imply that Matthew has figured something out. They'll tell you that, but they don't tell you what it is that he's figured out. That'll be revealed later on in the story, usually not too far away. And then other times, Matthew will just completely surprise you. So they'll use it, he'll use information that you know he was given in the book, and he'll prepare without telling you that they've prepared for an upcoming situation. So when the situation happens, he's surprisingly prepared. You had no idea that he'd done this. But earlier in the book, they had told you the information that you would that he would need to know to have prepared for these situations. Anyway, there's a whole lot of stuff going on there. But I love this Matthew Corbett series. If you wanted to compare it to something, it's got it's obviously obviously an homage to Sherlock Holmes. It's not the same, but there's no hiding it that this is got to be inspired by Sherlock Holmes. So Matthew Corbett isn't Sherlock, but it's very, you cannot separate them completely. They're in the same vein. And that's, that's what's awesome about it. Now, that's one of the things that's awesome about it. Now, the Queen of Bedlam is a long read for a lot of you, or for a lot of us. This particular edition here is 645 pages and it's a trade paperback, and it's got small typeset, so I don't know how many words it is. It's a whole lot of words, but it's a whole lot of worth it. If you're somebody that's intimidated by thick books and not passing judgment, Lord knows I sometimes will slip into the habits of reading a bunch of 200-page books and feeling satisfied that I read a bunch of books or reading a few six, 800 page books and feeling like I haven't made much progress in my reading. But don't be intimidated by these books. These are books that will make you not want to put it down. One of the things that I've noticed by Robert McCam, and especially in this series, something that I, I always kind of identified with Ray Bradbury. Well, he'll be telling a story straight, telling you the story, and then at some point, kind of slip off into a poetic type of prose. And I feel like I'm being lulled into a song, almost. And then it'll settle down and go back into telling a straight story again. I don't know, I don't know if that's intentional. I don't know what you would call it. But it's something that I noticed with Ray Bradbury from time to time. And uh, I'm, I'm finding that in this Matthew Corbett series, I didn't notice that in other Robert McCammon books that I read, like Swan Song. Maybe Boy's Life did it a little bit, but uh, Wolf's Hour. Some of the other Matthew or Robert McCammon books that I've read, I didn't really get that. Anyway, at the end of the day, I cannot recommend Matthew Corbett enough. Read Speaks the Nightbird. Read The Queen of Bedlam. Read Mr. Slaughter. Just go right down the line from first one on through. Don't skip. Don't start in the middle. You probably won't hate it if you do that, but these stories build off of each other. And uh, I'm sure there's a whole lot more to be said about this book, but I can think of no more lies to tell. I love The Queen of Bedlam. Ask me how to rate it. Uh, 10 out of 10, 20 out of 20, 100 out of 100, 5 out of 5 on Goodreads is 5 fat stars. I really love The Queen of Bedlam. Whereas I want to say Speaks the Nightbird is my favorite of the series, it's more sentimental. They get better as they go. Up to a certain point, they get better as they go. And naturally, you can only get so good before you start doing some of this stuff. But The Queen of Bedlam is better than Speaks the Nightbird, even though I sentimentally love Speaks the Nightbird, probably one of my very favorite books of all. Anyway, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. If you take a notion and think I wasn't too awful here, please subscribe to the channel. And I uh, can think of no more lies to tell, so say la vie, baby. Dude, Matthew Scudder. Matthew Scudder 